Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with everybody this afternoon. And I hope that after participating in this webinar, that I will give you some resources and some ideas about ways to be more effective in communicating both to lay audiences and scientific audiences as well. So thanks again for this opportunity. And this talk is based on a talk we've given widely at CDC. And the title really came from talking with my, my boss, who was really frustrated with the quality and thought we need to do more as far as training how we get our officers to give better scientific presentations. And she came up with this title, you know, the 1980s called and they want their slides back. And she said that to me in a moment of frustration because we really were facing a lot of resistance in getting people to change how they were giving scientific presentations. So during the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, why we're doing what we're doing, and how we're doing the training to help make our trainees and our fellows and our scientists at CDC more effective in communicating scientific information both to lay audiences and scientific community. So we're the Epidemic Intelligence Service. We're CDC's Disease Detective Training Program. And we're a hands-on training in applied epidemiology. We respond to outbreaks around the world and have the responsibility of helping to protect America and the world from health threats. So I have a question for you. If, if anybody has any paper and a pen or pencil available, or if you want to type this, ideally I'm going to ask you to write a couple things during the presentation. So if you have any paper and, and a pen available, it would be great. If you could jot down for you, when you have to give a presentation, what do you hope to accomplish when you give that presentation? I'll just give you a minute to jot down a couple of notes. So we're a training program. We were established in 1951. This image on the left on the slide is of Dr. Bill Fagey. He was an EIS officer, went through our training program, and he is largely credited for being one of the leaders in helping towards the elimination of smallpox globally, and then went on to do many incredible things, including leading CDC as our director. And in his most recent book, The Fears of the Rich and the Needs of the Poor, he's quoted as saying that the EIS program developed some of the approaches that remain even 60 years later. And many of those things are very positive. If you've ever seen one of our EIS officers present or some of our alumni, the presentations are very well organized, very regimented, and people are normally finished on time. That's because at our EIS conference that's open to the public, any of you, we'd love to have you come attend. It's in the spring of each year and there's no fee to attend as far as uh, registration just your travel to the conference, is where all of our ES officers are giving scientific presentations. And you'll see the quality and the expectations of the officers. This is what our presentations look for many years. This is mine from when I was an officer in 2005. You get a dark blue background, yellow titles, and white text. You have our CDC logo on the bottom right on all of our slides. And you're almost certain to find in every presentation some slide talking about calculation of infectious periods, tables with patient characteristics that are normally much longer and more detailed than this. You'll have at least one two-by-two two table. You'll have an epi curve, some much more complicated than this. And what we found, you may recognize this image, it's from a GEICO commercial where the hero is being tortured. And this is sometimes what our audience would look or feel like after sitting through repeated presentations at our conference or, or, our, or just about any scientific conference because the audience is being tortured by endless text-heavy PowerPoint slides. So when I asked you, what do you hope to accomplish when you give a presentation? I can tell you that our program in applied epidemiology and the practice of consequential epidemiology, what I mean by that is that all of our officers are expected whenever they do any study, research, investigation, it's intended that their results should lead to some meaningful action. So the expectation of our training program is we're also training them to write effectively and to give oral presentations where they can share really important information, recognition and conclusions in a manner that people can absorb them and use them and do something with them. So that's our expectation of what we hope they will accomplish when they give a presentation. Now, Nancy Duarte has several books. Uh, one of her recent ones is, is, is called Resonate 
presenting visual stories to transform audiences. And she talks about a continuum of sharing information. We all have had to draft reports that are exhaustive. It's got every detail in it, why we did the work, the methods of, of what we did, our results, and what we might recommend. And this is a foundational document that's really necessary to document what we've done so it can be reviewed and criticized and challenged and questioned to make sure that the work is evidence-based in leading to informed action. And from these reports, we'll often develop presentations. These are less exhaustive and intended to be explanatory. And from there, Nancy would argue that there's also stories, and this is a continuum. And based on teachers such as Nancy Duarte and what we're trying to do with our program is we're trying to bring a lot of these elements together to help people be much more effective and making it so that audiences can better absorb this information and do something with it. I'm almost certain all of you have seen a table like this. This is a classic table. This is actually from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you've probably seen this exact type of table be copied and put into a PowerPoint presentation. There's really no possible way the majority of people can take anything meaningful away from this massive, complicated table with this amount of information, which is why presenters will often use a laser pointer and they're going to swirl it all around and move it around and tell you, well, this is what I want you to focus on. So invariably, a table like this is not helpful for a presentation. That's for scientific papers. And so we're trying to get it and change the culture of having to include every absolute detail in order to appear scientific or that we know what we're doing in communicating with audiences. So this is an image of the CDC from an episode of South Park. And this is one of my colleagues, Captain Michael King from the U.S. Public Health Service, who's worked with me and, and the rest of our staff here with the IS program to really help push the training that we're giving and change the culture of how we present scientific information here at CDC. And like any person, Michael in this image is a very visual person. We're all visual creatures. And this probably has something to do with evolutionary biology, where we have all of our senses are very important. But at time is image and what we perceive through our visually can be dominant as we needed to be able to look across the horizon and detect threats, like looking in the grass and saying, is that a tiger back there that might be there waiting to eat me? And absolutely it is. And so it's important to know that at times our brain can really have trouble overriding signals that we're getting from color and image. So I want to give all of you a test. This is called the Stroop test. And I want to go ahead and ask, at the, when I, I'm going to say, on your marks, get set, go. And I say go, I want to see how long it takes each of you to read each of these words. On your mark, get set, go. All right, my guess is that by now, you know, around five seconds, all of you were able to successfully read each of these words. In a second, I'm going to advance the slide. And I'm going to show you another set of words. But instead of reading the word, I want you to tell me the color of each word. So it doesn't matter what's written. I want you to tell me the color of each word. And again, I'm going to time you. Ready, set, go. Were all of you able to complete that? I'm guessing that with this set of words, it took much longer for your brain to override, for example, that that first word written as blue, that you needed to say green. So this is just another example of how difficult it is because it's an autonomic process. Our brains are automatically attending to certain visual information and color is overriding the text in this case, making it more difficult to take us longer to read this set of words than the previous set of words where the letters actually match the color. So we know that throwing a bunch of numbers at people can actually cause problems with cognition. To consider anything, we need to be able to hold it in our working memory and move it to our long-term memory. 
So I'm sure all of you have sat through presentations where you've had very detailed slides and a lot of numbers thrown at you, and it can be very overwhelming. Now we have limited working memory, kind of like this glass that's, filled, that's not yet filled with ice cubes. And this is John Sweller's idea of cognitive load with the idea that we have a limited cognitive load and when we, over, when we overwhelm it, it interferes with our ability to be able to retain information. So it's really important that we don't overwhelm people and present them with the most essential information that we want them to be able to recall. So that requires that we be more efficient and how we organize and emphasize information. So we're going to do a test with this. It's a cognitive limit test. So I'm about to present you some letters, and I'm going to give you three seconds to look at this slide. And I want you to try and recall these letters. Ready, set, go. Now if you could go ahead and write down the letters as they appeared. Now you've had a chance to write down those letters. I'm going to give you a second set of letters, and I'm, again, I'm going to give you the same amount of time to view them, and then ask you to try and write them down. Don't write them down until you're done looking at the slide. Ready, set, go. I'm going to give you a second to write down that second grouping of, of letters. I'd ask, how did you do? My guess is that you were more effective in recalling the second set of letters. It's the same letters. The only thing that's different is how they are organized. There were 12 distinct pieces of information in the first set of letters. In the second set, they were grouped in more meaningful wording that you're more likely to recall like the acronyms IBM, ESL, and USA. So again, this reinforces the notion of how it's important how we group information to help people better recall the information and minimize the cognitive load. So again, when we're at presentations, when we're presented with a table like this, people think that this is really necessary to give everyone all the information they need for us to be scientific, to be persuasive, and to give all the details that are needed to convince people that we know what we're talking about. But in actuality, what we're doing is we're just overwhelming people's ability to absorb, retain, and use information. So I want to introduce a, another concept. Many of you have probably heard the phrase, seeing is believing or a picture is worth a thousand words. These phrases are really based on science. We learn best when information is presented verbally and visually together and they support one another. Because those are two different channels of receiving information, visual and auditory. And there's the dual coding theory that says when they're integrated properly, it can really help promote how we retain information. So for example, if I just say the word dog to you, you may or may not recall it. But if I say dog and I'm presenting with an image of a dog, you're more likely those two sources of information have better recall. In fact, if I'm only talking to you about something and just giving you words, three days later you might recall about 10% of what I wanted you to recall versus if I'm talking about a lizard or a dragon, and I'm giving you an image along with that that is integrated with that, three days later you may recall 65%. So there's a big difference between 65 and 10%. So again, if we use this dual coding theory to better integrate the use of images and text, we can really help people use this information that we want them to get from our presentations. The redundancy effect and effect. The concurrent presentation of text and verbatim speech causes problems. 
Duplicate info overloads working memory. You must choose to listen or read. People read faster than they speak. So we use Twitter speak, hashtag, why are they reading this to me, question mark, and hashtag, I could have just read the paper. Again, by the time it took me to read all the bullets on this slide, you had already finished reading them, and there was interference being caused because I was reading the same information that you were able to see on the slides. Now, for years, this is how we were training our scientists, was that they should have the same text that they read on their slides so as to promote cognition and recall. But again, as I've just presented to you, this can lead to interference because you're reading so much faster than I can speak. Another problem is the coherence principle together in the redundancy effect. Again, I could read these bullets again. Again, the message just here is that we have unnecessary distracting images like this clipboard that has nothing to do with any of the text that I'm reading on the slide. It also can interfere with cognition. So it's not enough, as I mentioned earlier, about putting together words and images. It's putting together the right words and the right images. So again, we really want to avoid torturing our audience. We want to present information in such a way that they're better able to attend to it and use it. Now, a byproduct of this is that people may actually find your presentations more enjoyable, but that's not the goal. The goal is to help people understand and take your main points and do something with them. Because that has been one of the criticisms that we faced in adopting this approach at CDC. Some people said, oh, well, you, it's not our job to entertain. And you're right, it's not our job to entertain. But it is our responsibility to engage the audience and to package the information in such a way that they can better understand it and use it. So how are we doing this at CDC? First, we're providing training and focusing on stagecraft. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Second, we're emphasizing storycraft, which is how we integrate a story into our scientific presentations or even our presentations to lay audiences. And third, integration of slide craft and data visualization, creating more effective visualization of the data that we want to communicate to our audience. So let me start with stagecraft. And I'm going to take you to and show you a couple minutes of a presentation where I think is a great example of stagecraft. Hear that? That's nothing. Which is what I, as a speaker at today's conference, have for you all. I have nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zippo. Nothing smart, nothing inspirational, nothing even remotely researched at all. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. Like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. I'm going to adjust my glasses. And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? OK, great. I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. Now, I'm going to react to that and act like I'm telling you a personal anecdote, something to break the tension, something to endear myself a little bit, something kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> And you guys are going to make an awe sound. It's true. It really happened. And now I'm going to bring it to a broader point. I'm going to reel you back in. I'm going to make it intellectual. I'm going to bring it to this man right here. Now, what this man did was important, I'm sure. But I, for one, have no idea who he is. I simply Google image the word scientist. And now, you see, I'd like it to seem like I'm making points, building an argument, inspiring you to change your life, when in reality, this is just me 
buying time. Now, if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the numbers. This is a real thing that's happening right now. The number of talks that I'm giving is one. Interesting facts imparted thus far in said talk, well, that's going to be a zero. My height in inches is 70.5. Note the 0.5 there. Two times six equals 12. And then interestingly enough, six times two also equals 12. That's math. 352. So I hope you could take away that from this example, and I encourage you to watch the rest of this TED Talk, the link is going to be available in the slide set, is here's someone with zero information to share, but what he's very effective doing is engaging his audience. So we work with our officers and our trainees to adopt effective strategies to engage your audience, how to adjust the rate at which you speak, adjust your tone, avoid distracting movements, and other techniques so that you can engage your audience. This is what we're calling stagecraft. And all of us can work at this and all of us can get better. There's certain people that are just natural at gripping an audience and the rest of us just have to work at it. And we can. So that's one thing that we do with our officers. The next domain is storycraft. And that's the idea that we can weave in a narrative arc into any of our presentations. And some people say, oh, I, I don't have a story to tell. If there's any work that's important enough to be done, we're always saying this is the rationale or objective of what we did, this is how or what we went and did, and this is what we learned or the results, and this is our recognition. That's a story in and of itself. And we're working with our officers this way to make it a more compelling story because we're a narrative people. That's how we, over time, have communicated things, and people better recall a story. So this is another technique for, again, engaging the audience and helping with the recall of our main messages. And a great example of that was at our EIS conference each year, we have the Langmere speaker. Alexander Langmere is the founder of the EIS program in 1951. So we always bring in a speaker for this. And a couple years ago, we had Sandro Galeaf, who's the dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. And he used a couple of these images to tell a story. Now, the point he was trying to make was that it's important that we must look past just individual level factors and behavior change. And he told a story about he's a really busy dean, and he doesn't really have time for a pet, but this is his pet goldfish. And he really cares about his pet goldfish, which is why on a regular basis he tells his pet goldfish, listen, each day when I leave you, I want you to swim a certain number of times clockwise, and then later I want you to go back and go counterclockwise so that you're being physically active and healthy. And when I put those fish flakes in, I always want you to only eat, just don't eat too much, because I don't want you to be overweight. And lastly, I'm probably going to introduce for you a goldfish friend. And when I do, I want you to practice safe goldfish, goldfish sex. And all these things, if you, if you do this, you can be really healthy. And one day he comes home and his goldfish is dead. Because he realized he hadn't changed the water for weeks. And really what his fish needed was a more supportive environment for health. And so in using this story, and he gave even more detail than this, I'm giving you an abbreviated version, he was helping make the argument, along with his broader talk, about the dangers of only focusing on individual level risk factors and ignoring, ignoring the impact that people's environment has on their health. So he was a great example of successfully combining a story with data in his talk and getting this main message across. And this, uh, the full lecture is available on our website that I'll be sharing later in the talk. And the third domain we're really working on is slide craft and data visualization. So this is how do we take those overwhelming tables that we've all been taught should be included in our presentation and more effectively organize that data to help people better understand the key elements and retain them. So these are some pre and post examples of a recent training that we have with our officers that uh, they were kind enough to share with me. So this is a pre-slide where an officer is talking about congenital syphilis. She animated it. So this is how it's transmitted. 
These are adverse outcomes. And it's preventable with timely screening and treatment during pregnancy. Those are the main points you wanted to make. And this is a very typical and standard slide that people would make to, to communicate that point. And this is our post slide. Syphilis can result in stillbirth, preterm birth, and early infant death. And it's preventable. And she combines this more limited text with very powerful imagery so that people get a greater sense of the magnitude of this problem and hopefully create some empathy because this also is something that helps with recall. Here's another classic type of slide you've probably seen in many presentations. And we look at this very well-constructed figure. We've got the title on the slide, data discordance in the fees region. Then we have another title of the figure. We have an x-axis, we have a y-axis, it's a bar chart, two different colors to compare, two things that we're comparing. We've got two explanatory boxes matching those colors. We've got this red line horizontally that's conveying something about over a certain time period. I'm not sure what the magnifying glass means. This is an overwhelming amount of visual information for anyone to consume. Then what he did is he turned this into a, dish, a different visual presentation. And right away by looking at this, you can see the purple is greater than the orange. And he's changed it so the title explains this. This is this key point, that the number of purple CSF samples analyzed exceeds the number of orange reported suspect cases of meningitis in the these region. And if you'd seen the broader presentation, you'd understand very clearly that we expected the opposite, that this was a surveillance system that should be capturing and that anyone that is a suspect case should have a CSF sample taken. So those two should be the same. And in some cases, well, they should be the same. So this is a much more easy to digest visual presentation of that same data. Another standard type of table you'd see in a presentation, the title of key findings from a case control study. You have in the first column the variable, the second column the odds ratio, and the third column the confidence interval. At the bottom you have a little note about some, the symbol for being not significant. The trainee again was able to convert that into a much easier digest visual presentation, again, with the bottom line up front or the bluff which is up at the title, which there are four characteristics associated with increased odds of peritonitis. And you can see which of those four labeled across the bottom in the magnitude based on the blue circles, where they fall, and the, the level of uncertainty with the size of the lines that go along with each blue circle. So a much easier to digest visual presentation of information. Now, how are we teaching officers to do this? Well, we make them aware of certain resources. Edward Tufte has been a pioneer in the field of data visualization. On the left on this slide is his visual display of quantitative information. That was one of the first texts in this area and a great contribution to the field. On the right is a more recent book of his. We also make sure our officers know about Nancy Duarte. I mentioned her earlier. She was the one talking about the spectrum of information going from a report to a presentation to a story. And she has several excellent books that help people and give them concrete examples and skills about how better to visually display information. And then we're working with Evergreen Data and Stephanie Evergreen, who comes in and does an all-day training for our trainees. She also does a training for supervisors, because we realized there was a clash between the two because we were training our officers, but not the supervisors. And the supervisors have been trained in the more classical methods didn't appreciate or understand why we were introducing this new format of less text and more images, and there was an inherent tension there. So by training the supervisors, many of them are much more supportive and working to help their officers implement these changes. And again, I put this slide up because I love Stephanie's message here that we aren't just here to look pretty. Again, these changes do help make your images look more visually compelling, but that's not the reason for doing it. It's for us to be more effective in communication. Now, this is a slide doc, and this is something that Stephanie and Nancy Duarte emphasize, and this helps us get around some of the criticism. So people are going to say, well, if you're taking off a lot of text on your slides and you're including more images, 
how am I going to know if I go back and look at this presentation later what the main messages were? Or what if I have more questions and I want to see more information to support some of the statements that you made? That's why we're training all of our officers to create this slide doc. This is easily created in PowerPoint. And what this is, this is an example from one of our officers. And on this first page that's focused on on the left side of the screen, you can see in the upper left is the actual PowerPoint slide that was included in her presentation. To the right of that is the text that she read that went along with that slide. And on the bottom is pasted in is the very detailed table that she used to create that figure. So someone that really wanted to go and look at the minute details to better understand how that figure is created, they have that. So all this information is easily put into a slide doc once you've created your presentation, and you can make this available for people after the presentation. Now, kind of in summary, I just want to get, again, some of the very simple things that you can start doing right away and having people that work with you and for you to have more compelling and effective presentations. One is have one key message per slide. We'll often have a conclusion or recommendation slides with five things on them. It doesn't take any additional time to break those five bullets out into five discrete points on five different slides. It's the same amount of information, but by presenting them one at a time, it allows for your audience to focus on and better retain each of those messages. The next thing is use of powerful and appropriate imagery. So this image is from a talk that I give to all of our trainees when they start. And the title of the talk is called Expectations. This is one of the first slides that I show, and I couldn't think of a better slide to get across one of the main points that I really need to impart with them. I'm going to give you a second just to look at the slide and see what you think of when you see it. What I see is, at that time, arguably one of the most powerful people in the world, stopping to take the time to say hello to someone who works in the support services in the White House. And if you note over, happened to note on the slide on the left, there's two gentlemen walking. One is very busy, and the other is looking on almost with a sense of pride, you might interpret if you read into it. And I show this to all of our trainees because my expectation by using this very powerful image is this is how I expect all of them to act once they start working at CDC. Because all of the work that they're doing, they're now a representation of our program, our disease detective training program. They're representing CDC and they're uh, representing the U.S. government in everything that they do Every time they go out and work with a state or local health department or travel to work with the Ministry of Health, I'm asking and expecting they treat everyone with absolute respect, regardless of their position or who they are. The other thing to do is you can start telling your story, just like Dr. Glea did, starting with the image of the, this fish that he cared about, the depth of the fish, and the factors leading to it, all trying to get to that main point of his narrative arc, that in public health, if we really want to see change, we have to go well beyond focusing on the individual and thinking about the social influences on health. So integrate a story, a narrative arc, and what you're trying to have people take away from your presentation. And again, when you do all these things, when you think about the visual security effect I talked about, about cognitive load, trying to present information in such a way that people can retain it, about dual coding theory, where you're incorporating the right image with the right text, and you're using stagecraft, you need to get your audience's attention. It's not like 20 or 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago, when people came to your presentations, and the only options they had were to pay attention, to daydream, or fall asleep. Now, if you don't keep your audience's attention, in a matter of seconds or minutes, they're going to be pulling out their phones, and they're off looking at something else that can better capture their attention. So it's just the way it is now, then in addition to giving high-quality information, 
we have to present it and package it in such a way that we can get the audience's attention. And then when we do that, we need to give it in such a way that they can retain it better. So making sure that we're packaging it in such a way that they can understand it, so they can retain it and use it. And we need to use more effective visualization of the data to help people understand our main points and to use that information. So this is a slide from our EIS conference where one of our officers was describing a very complicated investigation where the geographic locations were really important to the possible and ongoing transmission of disease. If you'd like to learn any more about our programs, you can go to cdc.gov backslash EIS, and there is a tab there on our conference. Again, everyone is welcome. We'd love to have you come to the conference uh, in the spring of this year. Attendance is free. There's also a link to all of our fellowships at CDC. And if you'd like any additional information, uh, you can use the email address there to email us, and we're happy to provide more information. And again, I really encourage all of you to try and incorporate some of these strategies to have more effective presentations. I can tell you that we faced a fair amount of resistance from some people when we tried to do this at CDC. And over time, overwhelmingly now, the feedback that we get from our conference evaluation of people coming to us is that they've really enjoyed the presentations, the changes that have been made, and they find it easier to take away the key messages and retain that information. And again, that's our goal as far as why we do scientific presentations. And so I'm finished with the presentation now, and I'm happy to uh, be available for any questions that people might have. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Eric. So at this time, if anyone in the audience has questions, you have two options. Uh, one, you can type in your question in the control panel, uh, or you can raise your hand pressing the raise hand button in the control panel and we'll go ahead and call on you and un unmute your line. So um, at this time, if anybody in the audience has questions, I'll just go ahead and pause and give you a chance to ask those questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the queue at the moment. Okay, actually, I did receive one, so I'll go ahead and and uh, read this. Uh, the question is, will the presentation be available for download? Um, I can go ahead and answer that, uh, absolutely. Uh, the session is being recorded, and by the end of next week, we're gonna submit a link to everybody who's a registered attendee so they have a chance to download it, uh, view it again, and share it with anybody that they'd like. And it looks like we actually have a, another question here. Any and this is for, for you, uh, Eric. Any specific suggestions when participating as part of a panel discussion? That's from Jan Kelly. Yeah, panels can often be really difficult. Uh, if you have the opportunity to present slides before part of the panel discussion, we definitely recommend incorporating what I presented here Otherwise, it's often a, a real challenge, as you know, because panels are often so dependent upon the discipline of the panel members to give concise responses and by the skills of the facilitator. When we do have panel presentations as part of our training and as part of presentations that we have at our, our monthly seminars that we have with our officers, we spend a lot of time with the facilitators and we also spend time with each of the presenters. And a lot of what we do is really making sure people understand our expectations as far as how much time we expect to spend on each segment and the type of content that we like covered. And so that ordinarily is where our emphasis is for a panel presentation, is setting those expectations and having a prepared and effective facilitator who's able to cut people off when they're going, or help them be more focused when they're going on too long. And secondly, being able to incorporate and make sure all members of the panel are having an opportunity to contribute. As we know, 
certain people may have a tendency to, to dominate a panel. I hope that's addressed your question. And we have another question here for you, Erica. The next question is, is knowing your target audience important? Absolutely. All these principles that I shared with you can be used with any audience. But the level of technical detail in the language that you use is important. And you can certainly use more technical information when you know that your audience is a technical audience. You know, for example, even when I used to, when I was focusing on global tuberculosis and HIV, when I'd go to a, a TB HIV conference, there were certain lingo and language that I could use that I, I could have a fair degree of confidence that the majority of people in the audience would know and understand. But when I would go and give that same TB HIV lecture at a broader global health conference, I can't assume that people had that same expertise in TB, HIV, so I had to change the way I spoke about things. And then when I would go to speak to a community and talk about changes that were being made and how we wanted to engage them in working to address TB and HIV globally, I would use entirely different language. But in all three situations, I learned to incorporate a story into the presentation so I could better engage the audience. And the other thing that I really try and do in all my presentations, and I tried to do it here today as best I could given this is a webinar format, is I follow adult learning principles as best I can. And we have guidance at that at CDC. I can, I can send a link along for you as well that we share with anyone that's giving a presentation or doing a training. And that's just understanding that even adults, they can only attend to someone speaking for so long before they're likely to become distracted. So you need to do certain changes to engage them and try and incorporate them in a participatory manner in presentations whenever you can. So I absolutely think it's really important to know your target audience and to tailor your language and your content appropriately. However, that, that doesn't change any of the principles I shared today about how adults learn and how we should package and organize information to help people be able to understand and use it. Excellent. I have one more question. Can you comment on using audio or special effects uh, for engaging the audience? I think it, you have to be very careful when you use multimedia because it can be really challenging. For example, for this talk, I was great that I had Randy and Amy here that we rehearsed and tested all the technology multiple times before we talked to make sure that it, it worked smoothly and that you could hear appropriately. So I really debated about whether to use that stagecraft video. But ultimately, because we were able to test it, I thought it was, again, something to change from you just having to listen to me and have the opportunity for you to see someone who I believe is very effective in stagecraft and a better example than I could have given just by telling a story. So I think there is a place for using it, but it's just important that it be tested to make sure it can run smoothly and that it doesn't distract from your main messages and that you're having a coherent presentation of what you want to accomplish. So hopefully I'll leave that to you to judge whether that was done for you today. I, this talk I've previously given, a, we've given a version of myself and my colleague Michael King at CDC about why we're, we're doing this, but it didn't have as much about how to do it. So I've made a lot of substantive changes to this in the last couple of days. So this is very, a, a new presentation and I'm gonna, certainly I'm going to go back and, and look at the video and have people evaluate as well to see whether I was successful at staying at these key messages that I hope, hope reached you. And we, have, we actually have another question that came in. Uh, what and where are the best resources to use when preparing a presentation? So I provided several texts that I shared with you that if you have time to read them are very helpful in creating more effective presentations. If 
you don't have the time to go through each of those texts, you can bring in a consultant like we've used. We've used Stephanie Evergreen. Edward Tufte gives seminars and trainings. Uh, Nancy Duarte is another. Um, there's another woman, um, Sherry Emery, who also uh, gives trainings and has a lot of examples on her websites. So there's a lot of groups out there that are giving training on data visualization. And what I would say is if you're going to have them come in, I would do what we do with Stephanie Evergreen, is then make sure that it's applied training that uses those adult learning principles that we have here at CDC. So for example, for all of our officers, they have to give in the fall of each year of their first year of their training program a surveillance evaluation presentation. That's where they've gone ahead and evaluated the surveillance system and give a presentation on it. So what we do now is they send in that presentation the day before the course starts. And they come to that course, and on the first day they're getting training on stagecraft and storycraft. And the second day they're getting training on data visualization. And each time they're getting those trainings, we're giving them time during the training at the end of the day to make changes to that presentation so they're applying what they're learning while they're learning it. And that's how I got those pre-post slides for you is it was just during that training, they were going ahead and applying what they're learning, which reinforces the learning, which makes it more likely that they're going to be more successful and better incorporate the use of that training. So if you have the resources, the most effective way to do this is to bring in someone to give you and your staff that training and have all of your staff and yourself bring a product with you and ask the trainer in advance that you want to have this experiential participatory training you're actually using that training in real time to make changes to something, getting feedback on it. And that's the best way to kind of introduce and implement this training in, in our experience. Excellent. Um, I'm seeing no more questions in the questioning queue. Uh, so thank you everyone for your questions. Um, and again, thank you, Eric, for uh, taking the time today to present. Uh, and just one final reminder, we will be providing the recording uh, by the end of next week. Um, and thank you today for attending. And I think that will conclude our session for today. So everyone have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.